Matthew chapter 21 is where we are. As we begin this morning, I want to get you to try and imagine that you are a first century Jew living in the hill country of Judea. I want you to imagine that you live on a little farm out in this hill country, or maybe you're a baker in a little town, or maybe you're a carpenter, or maybe you raise sheep, or maybe you are at home with a whole pile of kids, and you're looking after them in your little isolated area in the hillsides of Judea. Chances are, as you grow up in that place, you have not roamed far from home. In fact, if you know anyone who's been five miles from home, that's a big journey. Uh, people walked everywhere they went, or they rode uh, donkeys or something, so it wasn't, wasn't common for people to go very far, and, and really, why would you go anyway? Everything you need is right there in your own little community. But growing up in that little community and looking around at your own little place and not really ever dreaming of going anywhere, you still had one dream of one place you wanted to go. The law said that every Jewish male during his lifetime needed to make a trip from wherever he lived to Jerusalem for their most important feast of all, the Feast of Passover. And so everyone grew up, every Jewish male grew up knowing that he was never going to go far from home, but at some point he was going to try and go to Jerusalem and be there for Passover. What that meant too, of course, is then that everyone in his family would go with him and, and we would, you would have caravans of people, maybe even entire communities, going to Jerusalem. And the time that that actually got to happen was amazing. This is something you've been dreaming about your entire life. And now you're going to go to this far off land and celebrate God's goodness. Celebrate how he's looked after your people. Celebrate how, how God has watched over not only your ancestors, but you. A once-in-a-lifetime journey. That's what you would be thinking about. That's what you'd be dreaming about at this time of year. Because either you were going to Jerusalem for Passover right now, or you were already there. If you look at where the temple stood in Jerusalem these days, this is what it looks like. This is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem right now, and uh, that, that gold dome thing is a mosque called the Dome of the Rock. And uh, that's approximately where the temple that the Jewish people worship God, that's approximately where it stood. It sits in about that same spot. If you were back, not now at that picture, but if you were back in the first century, this is what that mount would have looked like. The, the same platform, but with the temple of Herod sitting in the middle. Herod's temple was built to, to appease the Jewish people and make them happy, and he built this beautiful structure to honor God. In fact, if you get a little bit closer and look at that main temple building in the middle, it looks like this. Um, the historian Josephus says that the, the temple was so beautiful from the outside, it had so much white marble on it, and the gold on it was so beautiful that as you approached Jerusalem, you could see the temple gleaming from miles and miles away. This was the center of the Jewish religion. This is where they thought God dwelled in ways that he didn't dwell in any other place. God lived in the Holy of Holies in that building in a way that he did not any other place. And so as you journey from your homeland, and as you come to Jerusalem, and as you offer your sacrifices at this temple, you feel closer to God than you've ever felt. Let's assume that you're there. Let's assume that you've made the journey with your family. Let's assume you've been hanging out in the courtyards of the temple, and you've been listening all week to various teachers, and you've been going to various classes, and you've been singing praise songs all over the place because they sung songs as they offered all their sacrifices, and you've been offering sacrifices for your sins and the sins of your family, and you're praising God for this one chance you get to be here 
at this celebration. Let's imagine you're there, and you're there for a week. But as, you, as you're walking around the temple, you start hearing something. You, you start hearing rumors about something else that's going on at the same time. Not only are all the sacrifices happening, not only is this place filled with thousands and thousands of people, but someone else is rumored to be coming to town. There's a whisper going around that Jesus of Nazareth is coming to town. Jesus, this guy who everybody says might be the Messiah, everybody says might be the Savior, might even be the Son of God, this Jesus that you probably have heard about somewhere might be coming to town. In fact, he might not only be coming to town, he's out in a little town named Bethany, which is just outside of town, two miles away. And when people hear that Jesus is just outside of town, they get ready and they start flocking out there to see if they can catch a glimpse of this teacher that everyone has been talking about. And then, even more incredibly, something more uh, special happens, something even more unexpected, something you never even thought of happens. You're waiting for Jesus to arrive in town and you're lining the street looking to see if you can see him. And then you hear this. Matthew 21, verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus said to his two disciples, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went out and did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed the their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And a large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, and the crowds went ahead of him, and all those who followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of God! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So you go out and line the road because you've heard that Jesus is nearby, and you go out and line the road, and when you get there, you find that Jesus is not only coming to town, but he's coming to town riding on a donkey. And if you understood your history, if you knew the prophet Zechariah, you would know that this is a big deal. Because the king that you've been waiting for is going to come to Jerusalem. This is what the prophecy said 500 years ago. This is what you're going to look for. Your king will come in riding on a donkey. He will come in humble, not with a great big entourage, but on a donkey riding in with the common people. This is what you're going to see when the Savior comes. And, and so the people recognize this. When they see it happening, they've heard the rumors about Jesus. They think he might be their savior. And when they hear that he's coming, riding on a donkey, what do they do? They go out and they throw their coats on the ground like a red carpet. They cut branches off the trees and lay them down. And they start celebrating. And they start celebrating, Hosanna! And they start yelling that the Lord has come. And they start saying that, that what this guy is coming in the name of the Lord. This is the guy we've been waiting for. This is our king. And in this great big city filled with all kinds of tourists, all kinds of people from all over the country, they start celebrating that their king has shown up. The king that God had talked about for so many years. The king that was going to liberate them from the Romans. The king that was going to start the new kingdom. The king is arriving. And can you imagine your feeling? You've only made one trip anywhere in your whole life. And you're in Jerusalem on the day that the king 
shows up. Can you imagine how you would feel? Can you imagine how lucky you would think you were? Could you imagine the joy that you are there at the moment God is going to change the world? Amazing, right? However, if you know the rest of the story, it didn't turn out the way that celebrating crowd on that Sunday morning thought it was going to. They celebrated the king who was going to come in and get rid of the Romans and set up his own kingdom and be a king in Jerusalem, maybe right at the temple. Maybe set up a throne right at the temple and be the king that God had waited for all these years. But you know what happens five days later. Five days later, the king they celebrated that came into town, who was going to change their earthly existence, is arrested and tried and crucified and put in a tomb. The king they had celebrated and waited for so long is gone again. He wasn't who they thought he was. They didn't get what they were looking for. And their celebration ended. What I want to tell you is that what they had celebrated and what they were looking for and what they were hoping for and the vision they saw on that day was not exactly the vision they needed to have. In fact, they would have been better off. They, were, they probably felt lucky to be there when Jesus came in that day. They probably felt lucky to see that. But they would have been luckier had they seen something else. They would have been more fortunate if they hadn't been in Jerusalem on that day, but if they had been at this place a few weeks earlier. This mountain is called Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is in the middle of the land of Israel. It's in the middle of a great big valley, and it sticks out of the ground just out of the middle of nowhere. The valley is a really significant place. It's a place where Deborah uh, fought and won a war for the God's people. The plain is a, is a place where many wars were fought with God's people and for God's people. And Mount Tabor is a really special place to the people of Israel. Before Jesus went to Jerusalem and before he was celebrated as a king, in Matthew chapter 17, he shows them something else. Matthew chapter 17 tells us a story that takes place on Mount Tabor. It doesn't involve a big crowd of people like his triumphal entry did. It doesn't include a bunch of visitors who had dreamed about this day forever. In fact, it includes just Jesus and Peter, James, and John. In fact, it's, it's not something people had looked forward to like they had for their new king. In fact, this, this vision here is one that they didn't really understand at first. And actually, as we read the Bible, it's a, it's a bit of scripture that often, even today, we kind of just jump over because we really don't get it. But we've got to see this. Matthew chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James, and led them to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Just then, there appeared before him Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Moses is the great leader of God's people, the one who gave them the law. Elijah is the, one of the greatest prophets. Two of the greatest men in the history of, their, of the Jewish people show up with Jesus in this moment. Verse 4 says, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, it's good to, for us to be here. If you wish, we'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Maybe he's thinking if he gives them a place to stay, they can stay there longer. This is too good to let it end. But while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. 
With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down on the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. Such a strange little story, right? Why, why does this happen in the middle of everything else? He's been teaching and healing, and then all of a sudden he grabs Peter, James, and John. They go up Mount Tabor, likely, is the traditional spot where this took place. And, and it says he was transfigured before them. That, that, that his, his face and his clothes became white as light. Uh, one of the other gospel writers says that his clothes became uh, whiter than any bleach could have made anything. And it just, he just shone. He was, it, light was coming from him. And, and we read this story and we think, well, what is this about? Well, what, is, what, is, what is Jesus doing here? Why is this story in here? Why, why, do we, why do we need a story about Jesus shining like light and then all of a sudden it's gone and they just go back down the mountain again? We need this story because this is the vision we have to have. We need this story because this is the part we really need to understand. We need this story because this story gives us the tiniest glimpse of what Jesus was like before he came to earth. When we read the story of Jesus, we understand that he was both God and man, but most of the Gospels talk about the man part, right? Most of the time we see him as a man. And so we read about Jesus sleeping, and we read about Jesus eating, and we read about Jesus traveling from here to there, and we read about Jesus touching people, and we see Jesus as a man. This is the one story where we get to pull back the curtain a little bit, and we get to see Jesus almost like he was before he showed up here. We get to see a little bit of his brilliance, and a little bit of his radiance, a little bit of what it means for him to have been God in the flesh. And those three men who saw him couldn't even look at him. It was so bright. They fell to the ground and they put their faces on the ground and they hid because they had no idea what they were looking at. But this is what they had to see. This is the important part. This is the part they needed to understand. And here's what I want to say to us today. That this is the Jesus that we need to see as well. This is the Jesus we need to see, not the king who's coming here to serve me and make this life better. Not the king who's going to come and get rid of the Romans. Not the king who's going to set up some sort of earthly kingdom and make my earthly life so nice. That vision that they had was the wrong one. That vision they had of Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a king wasn't understood properly because it didn't even last five days. What they needed to see and what we need to see is not Matthew 21, but Matthew 17. We need to see a, the Son of God, not who serves me, but the Son of God whom I serve, who I listen to, who I respond to. I need to see Jesus as a spiritual being, not as a physical one. And I need to trust Jesus to solve my spiritual problems, not just my physical ones. And I need to be thinking about bigger things, not just small things. I need to be thinking long-term things, not just next week kind of things. And we need to have a picture of who Jesus really is. The people of Jesus' day had a thought of who he was, but it wasn't who he was at all. They thought he was concerned just about physical things and physical kingdoms, and it wasn't true. We, it, we need a different way to see things. We need a different way to see our own life. We need to see through this lens, not through the lens that says, God's going to fix everything here. My encouragement to you today is, is simply that we need to start seeing things differently and we need to think differently and we need to make different priorities because when we start thinking differently and seeing things differently, then everything is seen differently. When, when, we, when we start seeing things through different eyes, 
when we start thinking about eternity, when we start thinking about what really matters, what really lasts here, then some of the things we worry about, we won't worry about so much. And some of the things we neglect will start becoming a lot more important. Because when you see things differently, you recognize what's true. You recognize what's important. You see things other people don't see. Let me tell you this story. You may have heard this story from a couple of weeks ago. The guy on, the, on our right, the man standing there, his name is Brian Hamilton. Brian Hamilton happens to be the equipment manager for the Vancouver Canucks. The girl in the picture, her name is Nadia Popovicki. Nadia Popovicki is a fan of the Seattle Kraken, a new NHL team that uh, just came on the circuit this year. Nadia decided with her mom that she was going to go to the first game that, that the Seattle Kraken played against the Vancouver Canucks because she used to be a Vancouver Canucks fan, but living in Washington, she decided she would change her allegiance and become a Seattle fan. So she wanted to see the game between her old favorite team and her new favorite team. And in fact, they bought really good tickets. They got in early and they got seats right behind the Vancouver Canucks uh, there's their bench, right behind the Vancouver Canucks bench. And so through the whole game, she sat there cheering for her new favorite team against her old favorite team. But there was something that was distracting her through the whole game. What was distracting her was the fact that Brian Hamilton, that guy there, was standing right in front of her. And she kept looking at his neck, because on his neck he had a mole. And, and she thought that mole doesn't look right. Nadia had been training in a, in, to be a doctor, and so she'd been sitting there watching the game and staring at his neck once in a while. She thought, that mole doesn't look good. So at the end of the game, as everybody was packing up, and she's packing up her stuff, and he's getting all the sticks and everything, she bangs on the glass, and he doesn't pay any attention to her. And she bangs on the glass again, and he doesn't do anything. And then she starts really banging on the glass, and he finally turns to her, and she holds up her phone, and she'd written a message on her phone saying, you have a mole on your neck that needs to get checked. And he looked at her, and he thought, well, what are you doing? He thought she was crazy. And he went, yeah, sure. And then he kept doing his stuff and wandered off. Nadia decided, well, that's all I can do, so she went home. Two or three days later, after the, after the road trip ended and they're back in Vancouver, Brian says to his wife, I had this crazy woman banging on the glass in Seattle telling me I've got a mole on my neck that looks kind of funny that I should get checked. And uh, his wife looks at it and says, well, maybe. So he went to the team doctors and the team doctors looked at it and said, oh, that doesn't look good at all. Long story short, it was stage two melanoma it hadn't broken through the surface of his skin yet, like under the layers under his skin. It hadn't moved yet, but it was, it was just on the verge of doing so. So he had the mole removed, and his doctor told him, if you had left this more than a couple of months, you would have been in big, big trouble. Problem is, Brian doesn't know who Nadia is, so he puts out a thing on social media saying, anyone know a girl who sits behind the... You know, visiting team's bench at Seattle Kraken games. I'm looking for this girl, long black hair, blah, blah, blah. She had a conversation with me. Someone told her about that note because she had told them about the conversation anyway. Long story short, they end up meeting together. Long story short, he gets to talk to her and thank her for saving his life. Long story short, both Seattle and Vancouver get together and help pay for her medical school now. Why am I telling you this story? Because a pile of people, including his wife, including team doctors, including everyone he'd met for days and days and days and days, had seen this mole on this guy's neck and had done nothing about it, weren't even alarmed, couldn't have cared less. But one girl who was trained to see differently recognized what it was 
and made a difference in his life because she could see it. She saw what no one else saw, even though they were all looking at the same thing. What I'm encouraging us this morning is, is that we've got to get a different vision. We've got to start seeing what other people don't see. We've got to see differently than someone else. We've got to start recognizing spiritual truths and spiritual opportunities and spiritual things around us. We need new eyes to see something different. We've got to get a vision of who Jesus is. We've got to get the Mount of Transfiguration kind of picture of Jesus rather than just the Jesus is coming to make my life better picture. We need some different eyes. In fact, actually, if you read this story, it's told by all three of the gospel writers. The story of Jesus' transfiguration where he starts shining, it's told by all of them. I like one detail that Luke gives us, though. Uh, he says in chapter 9, verse 32, as he tells the story, he tells us that they went up on the mountain and the disciples, like they did oftentimes, fell asleep. But I like this part. It said, Peter and his companions are very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. I don't know about you, but I don't know that I've always been fully awake to the glory of God. I don't know that I've always been fully awake to what God is doing. I, I'm not even sure I've been fully awake to the fact that I'm a spiritual person and there are spiritual things happening because I get so overwhelmed by the physical things. I get so overwhelmed by my problems and my worries, I forget about spiritual things half the time. But when they were fully awake, they saw God's glory. And I think we need to wake up we need to become awake to what's real. We need to see what's happening. Because if we could get even a little vision of who God really is, if we could be like Peter, James, and John and just get a little glimpse of Jesus' glory and understand what's going on here, understand what kind of help we have, understand how powerful prayer is, understand that this isn't our home. The, the stuff going on here is just a breath. It's just a moment. If we could get that picture, if we could get a picture of eternity, then we'd see everything differently. And we'd see everything better. In fact, we would see this life better too. As I was writing this, this came across my desk. I have no idea who Jeremy Taylor is, but he said, It is impossible for a man to despair who remembers that his helper is omnipotent. omnipotent. Which is a really big word and hard to say, but really means it is hard for a man to despair when he remembers his helper is all-powerful. You know that you have a helper in God that is all-powerful. If you can get that transfiguration vision, if you can see Jesus as he is, and who he is, then why would we ever be scared? Why would we ever be worried? Why would we ever be upset? What could ever hurt us? I really like in Matthew 17, too, that Jesus says after he shows them this picture of himself and after they are terrified of it, Jesus says this, get up, don't be afraid. This isn't something to be afraid of. This is a blessing. You've got the God of the universe walking with you. You've got the God of the universe with you right now. You've got the God of the universe caring for you and looking after you and with you. And that is a vision we need to see. When I started this, I said that the people of Jesus' day were celebrating and, and having a great time because they thought their physical king had shown up and they were wrong. But even better, their spiritual king had shown up. They had celebrated because they thought their physical troubles were over, but because of the cross in less than five days after this, their spiritual troubles were over. And that's the part they should have been celebrating. And that's the part we need to be celebrating. Because we have a God who can do anything, and that's the God we need to see. A God who reaches beyond just what we're worried about and through eternity and time and everything else. I love in the book of Revelation, the last promise, one of the last promises of Revelation, God says, Behold, 
I am making all things new. What trouble do you have today? What are you worried about? What are you wringing your hands about? Who are you concerned about? A physical king won't fix any of those things, but your spiritual king could. Your spiritual king could make it better. That's the king we need. That's the king we need to see, and that's the king we need to follow. Brothers and sisters, the king has come, and his kingdom is here. You are living in it, and you, best of all, are a child of that king. Let's take our communion. so often we get tied up in physical concerns and worries. We, we get worried about things that are really legitimate. Sometimes there are things to be concerned about, but other times we create our own worries. We fret about things as if we're all alone. We act as though we have no help. Father, as we partake of this loaf today, would you remind us once again that you have everything in control that even before we were born, you knew us. You know every hair on our head. You're looking after everything for us. That even before we knew we needed a way home, you created a way home through your son. You offered the sacrifice that we couldn't sacrifice on our own. Fathers, we remember his body today. Help us not just to remember our forgiveness, but help us to remember your care. In your son's name, amen. Father, as we take this juice, this physical element, help us to remember not the grape juice, but help us to remember the spiritual element. Help us to remember the blood of Christ. Help us to remember that we're forgiven, that we're washed, that we're cleansed. Help us to remember that his sacrifice paid for what we couldn't. Father, help us to not just see the physical and worry about those things, but help us to think spiritually. Help us to see a vision of you so that we might be transformed as well. In your son's name. If you're watching my video today, thank you for doing so. Uh, may God bless you with new eyes so you see better this week as well.